but um, I don't know. She just, she just didn't take care of the house and I never had the money until recently to do anything with it. So I've been repairing it and I ended up with this crack down in the foundation, cinder block foundation. And it just, it just costs so much to get that something like that fixed. Mm. And now it's like, I just, my son really wants me to get into this broker and see if that he wants me out of the house. I said, well, don't you want it? I'll fix it up. <laughs> he said, no, <laughs> cause he doesn't want the frustrations <clears throat> of the house that I'm going through and have been going through. But, it's just not easy to do, you know, after my surgeries and, you know, all the stuff that I went through, it's like, gosh, how can I tackle this? The only help I just know is God almighty just coming through and helping me to get out of a house. I don't need the stress and pressure of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, I don't have any mortgage payments. I have <clears throat> nothing on the house. I don't owe anybody anything. <laughs> I own my car. I own this house. And, and it's a good situation to be in. And I'm almost afraid to step out and start paying rent and, you know, that kind of thing. I just, I don't know. It's just a hard, hard decision. <laughs> I need to listen to a teaching on decision. <laughs> <laughs> well there's always the uh the way air conditioning got started is they would take big blocks of ice and blow a fan over it hey that's a thought well they used to have the units that you could roll around and you just filled them up with ice cubes <laughs> you know right. that's that's before we had really had air conditioners in automobiles <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you remember that or not, but <laughs> I used to drive cars without air conditioning. Oh yeah, that but, was yeah, no one had. But they also had a lot of horsepower, so I could get a lot of in wind going in through the windows <laughs> as I'd race down the road. <laughs> well, we uh, we lived in Florida uh, when we, after, you know, early in our marriage, in a and we had a Volkswagen Beetle. When we lived in Florida, I had no air conditioning. <laughs> and when it's 95 degrees, it's 95 <laughs> degrees whether you're going 10 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, well, really I, have, <laughs> I drove one of those too. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a lot of several different kinds of cars, but yeah, that, that little beetle was <laughs> just a little beetle. <laughs> Well, how's everybody doing? <clears throat> it's good to good to be here together. It's it's always interesting to sit down and have pictures of people from all over the place. It is it's very interesting, interesting way to spend the evening. Uh, and we've just been chatting. So anybody have any blessed notes or um, how's your day been? Interesting thoughts. And remember, you're muted. You, when you come on, you're muted. So, if anybody would like to share it all? I don't know. I, I'll, I think of things during the week, and now I'm just like a total loss as to what I thought I could share. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, there is a certain uh, peace that comes and comfort when believers get together. So, sometimes... Yes. The cares of the world just kind of are put on hold uh, when we just hang out together. I mean, there's there's a healing that takes place just by being <clears throat> fellowship, and there's a real power in that. That it, you know, it's, if 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 Jesus really is in the midst, which I believe is true, then the presence that He brings and the the you know the power in that situation is a real it's a real thing. And things happen just by being together. Well, speaking of that, last night, a uh, few of us didn't know that the um, Zoom meeting was cancer. So <laughs> we were in the meeting and, was, uh, and then 
we learned that, you know, it was cancer. So as long as we were there, it was just few of us, but we decided to, you know, just lift some of the things, pray and do manifestations. And, and we were blessed, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it's just coincidence, but you know, it wasn't, it, it, the Lord was present and, and I was blessed. I, I think everyone else is did say, you know, just to only, I think we had like five of us, um, but it was great. So that, that was really blessing. That's what I would like to share tonight. <laughs> That's my part. I share my part. Well, I'm glad when Jesus said that, he said, where two or more are gathered in my name. <laughs> he just said, where 30 or more are gathered in my name. That would have been a real problem. <laughs> but two, two we can mostly handle. Yeah. I had an interesting thing happen to me this week and just reminded me of um, how God just really, whatever we do for him is, is a pretty tremendous thing. So about 25 years ago, I used to teach preschool. And so this week I was in the grocery store and this cashier said to me, do you still teach? And I looked at her and I said, no, I don't teach anymore. She said, I, cause you were a wonderful teacher. And I said, oh really? And she tried to remember where she knew me from. And I had taught her and, but I taught her when she was five years old. And so now she's about 25 and I didn't recognize her. And I told her, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. But when she said her name, I remembered her name. And you know, I just thought that God doesn't forget anything. And, you know, even those things that seem small and insignificant to us are a big deal to him. So that was pretty cool. That is cool. What a beautiful, just to know that you've impacted her in such a way that she remembered that you were a good, I mean, I don't remember hardly anything from my fifth year, but um, yeah, what a blessing. Yeah. So I guess I'm doing the right thing. I'm in the right place. <laughs> Amen. I had a crush on my kindergartner teacher, but that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's somewhere else. That's. <laughs> I think a lot of little boys do. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it could have been because she always had graham crackers and milk. Now that could have been the key. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Demars. Hey, I wanted to ask Dave, I didn't know if you had a, a song or not. I didn't want to uh, not do something if you had something, but if you don't have something, that's okay too. So I'm, not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything like that. I've, I've had this one going through my head all day. <laughs> Um, it's, it's not, not, head all, in my not, head. All, not it, all the words, but the music that goes through my head. Uh, I've had Inagata Davida going through my head all day. Is it that one? What's that? <laughs> He's playing. You have to look that up on the internet. It's an old rock and roll oh, song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of the some of you know the the text of the song by a different, um, I think, Gaelic melody, um, but I have. I have one, a melody that's in my head from uh, my uh, Catholic background. So, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> unless, you, unless you are an old Catholic. Yeah. Unless you're an old Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> you have to practice Catholicism. <laughs> but it's called Be Thou My Vision. Oh, oh yeah, that. that's a yeah. great song. <clears throat> but, but you'll have to, I'm going to do it with the, the Catholic thing that I have in my head. <laughs> but you're thinking, you know, da, 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 da. But I'm going, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not is all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. 
Thou my wisdom and thou my true word, I ever with thee, thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father, I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my breastplate, my sword for the fight. Be thou my armor, and be thou my might. Thou my soul's shelter, and thou my high tower. Praise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Amen. Nice. Thank you very much. Yeah. I don't know, all of a sudden we got big. big on our screen. <laughs> I was singing at my big self. <laughs> Uh, my cat was singing along with you. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that one, huh? Right? Yeah, exactly. Were you a ca uh, previous Catholic? Is that how you say that? Were you a Catholic, Catholic at one previously. time? <laughs> Catholic previously. Yeah. Well, matter. Catholic does start with cat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 Here. <laughs> well, why, why don't we pray? Well, Father, we are thankful that you are our vision. When we put you on, when we put the new man on and put the old man off, the vision that we have is the vision that you have for us. And mm -hmm. you are our future and that you've implanted with us, inside of us, your hope. And we can keep our hearts tuned to yours. We're thankful for the grace and the mercy that helps us to have a song in our heart each and every day that we can walk out in hope, that we can have a positive godly influence on those that are around us, and that they can see in us the vision that you have placed in us. And we're thank you. We're thankful, Father, for the love that you've given us, that warms our hearts, that wins our hearts, that keeps us walking with you, that we can be love the way that Christ Jesus was loved, to lay our lives down moment by moment to those who need our help, those who need our insight, those who need the wisdom that comes from you. We praise you for this time together, for your words, for your heart, for the insights and the revelations, the inspiration that you give that helps us to live our lives more full and more joyful every day. And we praise you in this, in Jesus' wonderful name. And anyone who'd like to pray, anyone who'd like to bring forth worship manifestations. <laughs> I just like to pray for Vicki um, and her house, whatever that she needs to be taken care of um, in her comfortable way and in comfort in her situation. And God, I intervene in her behalf and, and you, you help her anyway, shape and, shape and form, you know her, this, her situation ins and out. So I leave Vicky to you with her house and better place or whatever it may be you have it in 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 your mind, Lord, and bring forth and uh, and so situation would be taken care of. I leave that to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to pray for Chris Green and her family right now, particularly who mo her mother, who is uh, not doing well, apparently, in the last stages of um, cancer. 
and I just thank you for being with her and strengthening her. And I thank you for Chris's family too, Chris and Chris's family that they're doing their part and taking care of her. And I'm sure that it's a lot of work and a, and a lot of emotion involved. And I just lift the situation to you and thank you for working in there and, and helping them out in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I lift to you my sister and her mission group as they prepare to spend the next three weeks in Africa. And Father, that your hand of protection and blessing is on them in their lives and that they have safe travel and that they can fill the gap for those men and women and children that are desiring to hear more of your word. And I just ask that you bless them all tremendously and bring them back home safely. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And Heavenly Family, Father, and Lord Jesus, I ask for your hands of blessing upon the conference that we have coming up next in just a what? Next week. Next week. So thankful for all those who have uh, are involved in putting this thing together and to thank you for their lives. I'm sure there's the home office um, <clears throat> staff or, or deep into that. And just thank you for their lives and for giving them the guidance and all that they need. And I lift to you all the people that are going to be attending, Lord, that they have safe travel to and from, and that they, have, they can all have an open heart and open mind for receiving the greatness of your word and the greatness of the fellowship that we have one with another of members in particular in the body of Christ. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, I just, I praise you. I thank you for the opportunity that I had recently to be with all my family in Mississippi. I pray blessings upon my niece, Grace, and her new husband, Scott. I pray that the conversations that we were able to have just stirred in, in the lives of my, of my brothers who have turned away from you, Lord, and that I just praise you that you are always watching for your children to come back to you. I lift up my father. I pray that you will continue to surround him with people, Lord, that he will listen to and that he, he can trust regarding you. And um, again, I just... I just thank you for all that occurred there. And I, I just, I praise you that you are a God of relationship. You are the inventor of marriage and family. And uh, I just, I just praise you. You're, you are just so kind and gracious and good, Abba Father. Lord Jesus, I, I'm just humbled at how you continually walked amongst people with, with no judgment, and unless it was people like the Pharisees, but those stuck in sin and addiction and ridiculousness, you just kept reaching out to them and loving them and showing them who you are. And I, I pray that we can grow in our ability to be like you, to your glory. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I'd like to pray for my trip, uh, going to see various relatives on my way to the National Conference, and just pray, God, that you protect them from wicked ideas and things so that when I arrive, we can have good conversations. And I also pray that you just remind me not to be the answer man, but the question man, and, and uh, help build conversations so that we can get at the truth and 
And I just thank you for their hearts and their lives and just protecting them this week. And I thank you for all the preparations for it all, God, just to help me and, and uh, make it as uh, fruitful as possible. In the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Melehidi el Santos Pekele Niñano Sorovella, Zila Eleli Atano Solumanta, Keleni Andantos da Peleti Atolas Delia, Moro Sadanta Eleti Santos Pololos da. O heavenly, glorious Father God, thank you for your wonderful blessings in our lives, Father. We praise you that you are such a merciful God, that you have given us your Son Jesus so that we may have everlasting life with you in the future to come, Father. We wait with bated breath, Father, for your son's return. We thank you, Lord God, for all of the many blessings in our lives. We thank you for the blessing of health, prosperity, love, and knowing that we are cherished by you and your son. Also, God, I would also like to pray for my Children, that you would strengthen their uh, foundation of belief in you and your son, Jesus, Father. I pray that you would watch over them and their health while they're suffering from some colds and illness that has going around in their areas, Father. I ask that you bless them with prosperity in their lives and a desire to come back to you, Father. I thank you, Lord God, for the upcoming cataract surgery that I'll be having in October, and I thank you, Lord God, for blessing the doctors so they will do a perfect job when the job is done. I thank you, Lord God, for Doug and his health, and I praise your glorious name, Father. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for my little sister, Martha, being able to come visit and just enjoying this time that you've given us with her babies and um and god i lift up to you our country and the upcoming elections especially pray for california and um the candidates and the elections here god i pray that you would um just bless the people lord with um with victory, the people that serve you here, Lord. And I just pray for um, the families that have lost their homes and the fires. And I just pray for uh, being with them and giving them, um, showing your face to them, Lord, and in this time and, and giving them peace and, and uh, provision. And, um, and God, I just, I just thank you so much that we can come to you all over the, all over the country and, um, and just listen to, to your word and uh, that we, we truly do have a place to go. And I, I thank you so much for that, Lord. And all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you for, um, thank, thank you. Am I coming through? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Father, for just how wonderful and how big that you love us. Thank you, Father, for your grace, your favor upon us. And thank you for every one of us represented here and all of our brothers and sisters all across the planet for every need that you see there that you can take care of every need, whether it's food, shelter, relationship, whatever the need is, that we are meek and humble to receive the need met by you, that we can be humble to cast our care upon you because you will take care of us. I just know you will. You're an almighty God. You heal people. You keep us in good health. You, whatever the need is, Father, I thank you for that kind of love that you have for us. And we can just know without a shadow of a doubt that you do love us, not because of what we do 
or what we've done, but because of who we are, who you made us to be with Christ in us. And I thank you for that kind of love. I thank you for your giving. And I thank you for, oh, your word that makes us free, your word of truth that truly makes us free. Thank you so much. Beloved, that the same power that I used to raise your Jesus from the dead now abides within you. Push yourselves to see yourself as I see you, for truly you are my masterpieces and you are my mighty warriors within the spiritual battle. Mindfully pray each and every day. Set aside time to pray. Praise, set aside time to commune. Know that your prayers make a difference in the spiritual battle. Know that your Father loves you and that you are mighty in His sight. Push yourselves to see yourselves that way. I am the God and Father that has known you from before your mother's womb. You have been precious in my sight all the days of your life. Walk in great confidence, knowing that I hold you within the hollow of my hand, that there is nothing more precious in my sight than you. Be confident and walk always in great boldness, knowing that I am ever by your side. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, well, uh, tonight we're going to do some technology here. So watch how my fingers never leave my hands. Um, we are going to look at... Uh, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to look at what it really means, what it takes uh, to live a longer life and live a better life. I mean, that's really what it's all about is living a better life. And this is one of those teachings where where I started and where I ended up was two different places. But when that happens, I'm always so amazed at how God's mercy and grace uh, reaches out to teach things that I hadn't expected. And it, this is one of those uh, teachings where science says one thing about what it takes to live long, and God's word says something else, and they seem irreconcilable. And tonight we're going to see that they're not really. So we're going to look at God's view of living long and what really matters. And uh, now, can you guys see that down there? Let's see, my thing's in the way. All right. So, one of the problems I had was my idea of a merry heart meant that, uh, let's see, well, what did I do here? All right. If you hit the little arrow on the bottom left, there's a left arrow and a right arrow. Does that That's do it? Weird. That's not how it usually works, but okay, I see it. Thank you. So here's the problem. If a merry heart does good like a medicine, then do comedians live longer? I mean, it seems like an honest question, right? And it turns out that clean comedians do live longer. So Bob Hope, uh, Red Skelton, um, uh, um, George Burns, a lot of these guys live to be in their late 80s, 90s, and even 100 or over 100. 
And if you go back and look at the clean comedians, uh, a lot of them live longer. Now, likely they lived clean as well. They probably, you know, were better than the guys, you know, the comedians, some of the comedians these days who probably don't live very good lives. But these people did probably live, live clean lives, but still a merry heart looks like it does do something to live longer. Well, that's what God has always said. So the world seems to be backing that up. But what can we do? What can we do to live longer and live better? And so we have to ask ourselves first, well, what is it to, what is it to live long? Living longer, what does that exactly entail? Well, I think from God's perspective, and I, I believe the Bible backs this up, is that he's always talking about long life in the context of not only this life, perhaps, but especially the next age and the new heaven and earth. So certainly we know uh, when we're born again, we're saved, we have salvation, and that gets us to a place where, you know, it, it gets our heart to a place where we're going to have life in the age to come. And so certainly that is, a, a you know, for sure what God means by living long, but it may not play out in this life like we think. And, you know, it is, uh, it's a dangerous world that we live in. There's a lot that goes into, uh, you know, living life. And, you know, um, you know the, the book, Don't Blame God, brings up a lot of aspects about, you know, choice and the evil of the world that we live in. Uh, so it may not play out in this life like we think. And so our goal has to be to live a joyful life, you know, to enjoy the journey uh, and to be the best that we can at every moment in our life. And that's, you know, that's uh, saying a lot for us in where we are in life at the moment. And so certainly living a better life, living a fuller life is for sure something that we can do with the things that we have within our grasp. And we're going to see that faith, hope, and love are the key. And so, you know, it's no question that, you know, the uh, God has called us to a place uh, to be faithful, to be trusting of him, to have a hope within, and to live love every moment of the day. And so these come in rather interestingly at the end of this uh, sharing. So it's very interesting. And of course, we know the greatest of these is love, and we may just see that in where we end up. So we need to look at what man thinks it takes to live longer. And there really is a lot of what's you know, a lot of things being said about what you can do to live longer, things on the internet, you know, things on the television, books to read. Uh, there's a lot on this. But does science really prove what God's word says? And of course, we know that real science always does prove what God says. And that science that doesn't prove what God says often either takes a while to get caught up to where God is, or, or has some ax to grind and is going down, you know, a wrong road. So first, let's look at the traditional things that we've been told uh, you can do or people can do to live longer lives. And so I asked this question two weeks ago, and I said that I would get back to it. And so if you've been patiently waiting, here it is. So my question a couple of weeks ago was, what percent of long life is determined by our genes? And, you know, you know clearly we have internal factors that control the... Uh, length that our cells live. Our cells are regulated by genes. Those genes are programmed in certain ways. And there's some things we can't change. The internal factors of our body, we have no control over. And so if we can figure out what percent of, our, uh, of how long we live is determined by our genes, then the remaining percent is due to other things other than internal factors. So external factors or outside choices, you know, outside factors are things like our, our choices, our environment, and these are things that we may have some control over. Now it's interesting if you look at twin studies, and this is where they look at identical twins uh, who've gone down separate different roads in life and see how they get sick when they're not living together, um, see what their choices uh, they've made in life and how that affects how long they live. Twin studies have determined that the, the, the percent of our life, length of our life is determined by our genes only to about 10 to 25 percent of the time. So that means the other 75 to 90 percent of how long we live is dictated by outside factors. And these are some factors that we can have control over. 
Now, whether or not you can have control over these factors is determined really by where you live. So this is a, a very interesting um, graphic that I found. And uh, the, the axis along the bottom is how long men live. And the axis, the up and down axis is how long women live. And what they did is they looked at uh, many of the, this is, represents about 120 of the 157 countries or how many other countries there are on, on earth, but about 120 countries that, you, that they actually had data for, for the average length of life a man has in that country and the average length of life a woman has in this country. And one of the things that you see right off the bat is that industrialized nations are toward the top of this curve, this graph, and those are, uh, you know, the United States, the United Kingdom, um, you know, China, uh, and then the, the countries at the bottom, whoop, oh, I hate when I do that. Uh, the countries at the bottom are, uh, there we go, um, are, are th third world countries. So Nigeria, you know, Botswana, you can see the names down there. And what you see is that where you live can have a drastic influence on how long you live to be. So if you look at the United States, this point right here is about the middle of the United States bubble. And that says that the average man in the United States lives to be about 77 and a half. And the average woman in the United States lives to be about 83. And if you go down here to some of these third world countries, I mean, to live 50, whether you're a man or woman in some of these countries is about as, you know, it's the, about the average. So these are very dangerous countries with a lot of, of impediments to living long. And I just wanted to point out here Monaco, um, which was kind of surprising. Monaco is way up here at the top. And I don't know what they have in Monaco that is so good. We're actually going to talk about some places where people live a long time, but I'm surprised that Monaco is up there. And so if you, if you break this down a little bit, if you look at third world countries, a lot of what's going on in that country determines how long a person lives. And almost all of that is out of their control. So access to safe food and water, um, access to a healthy diet, access to good hygiene, uh, access to health care. You know, these are countries that are torn by war and violence. All these things cause people to have very short lives. Uh, governments often are unstable in these uh, countries, and there's no public, you know, safety at all. Infrastructure is horrible, uh, you know, cars and traffic, and, you know, people die in all sorts of ways in a lot of these countries. But now where the countries that we live in, industrialized nations, almost all of those six things that were on that last slide are already attuned and accounted for. And so really living in industrialized nations, almost everything uh, that controls whether we live longer is in our own hands. And so it's things that we can do because we have safe water, we have safe food, we have access to health care. Uh, you know, we can, you know, we can do things. That we just take for granted public safety. Uh, our governments are relatively stable. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that's always in question, you know, but most of the governments are stable. Uh, but, and so we have the freedom to try the latest fad diet. We can listen to Oprah and Dr. Oz for advice. We can go down <laughs> all kinds of roads uh, to live longer and, you know, see where that takes us. But there has to be something, you know, studies that actually show that things do make a difference. And what are those things? So we can look at longevity studies. These are studies where they, they've followed people for years. Some of these studies are 80 years old, over 80 years old, where they follow these people from when they're born and they see what they eat, they see where they live, they see what healthcare they get, their choices uh, that they make in life, the food they eat, the habits they have, and then they see how long they live. And so there are things that we can look at in these studies and there are lessons that we can learn. So I don't know if you've ever heard of blue zones, uh, but there's uh, sort of a, uh, a uh, books written about blue zones. There's a lot on the internet about blue zones. Just Google blue zones and you'll be amazed at the stuff that's out there. And these are areas in the world that this is how they're described. These are areas 
areas in the world where people forget to die. So these are areas in the world where people live really long. And so what they did is they thought, hmm, I wonder what it is about these, these pockets of people that makes them live so long. And so they, they found that the average ages of these people get to be the 90s and low 100s without too much, you know, you know not too much work. Uh, and it, there's something to do with where they live and how they live there that makes a difference. And so what are the common threads of these blue zones? We're going to look at that. And are there things there that we can adapt to our lifestyles and maybe live better and longer just by looking at how these people live in these blue zones? So I'm going to show you the five blue zones that were the, part of the original study, three of which have been studied rather extensively. So one is Sardinia, Italy. So Sardinia is, a, is an island in the uh, uh, sea around Italy. And there's some isolated villages on that island where people live really long. One is in Okinawa, Japan. Now, Okinawa, I thought was a city in the, on the mainland. Okinawa is actually a chain of islands. Uh, so it's a series of islands that's called Okinawa. And there's certain tiny islands in, the, in this chain of islands where people live really long. Uh, Loma Linda, California, and there is a pocket of Seventh-day Adventists who live in Loma Linda. That's kind of like their ground zero for Seventh-day Adventists. And in this enclave of Seventh-day Adventists, they live really long. Uh, there's a peninsula in Costa Rica, and certain isolated portions of this peninsula have villages where people live long. And there's a tiny island in Greece. It's in the Aegean Sea uh, in, the, in Greece. Uh, where people live really long. So what they did is they looked at all these communities and they teased out what exactly it is that's unique to these communities. And they made this graphic, which I just love. And so this is a Venn diagram. So those of you who thought you could get away from math, uh, this is a Venn diagram, which is a way to represent data. And this is looking at three of those uh, communities uh, at the top is Loma Linda, uh, to the left is Sardinia, Italy, and to the right is Okinawa, Japan. And each of those circles uh, represent the, the uh, things that they do in those communities that they think help these people to live long. And so where the groups overlapped, you can see uh, the circles overlap, and inside the parts that overlap, they put the descriptions of traits that those different communities share. So in the middle are five things that, uh, or six things, six things among the things that they share together. And so we're gonna look at those particular traits and some of the side traits and see what it is that actually made a difference for these people. Uh, and you can go online. If you Google blue zones, uh, you know, go on Wikipedia and put in blue zones or just go to Google and put in blue zones. Uh, they have all this information in there. Can you go back to that? I'm sorry. I was going to just take a picture of that. Thank oh, you. Sure. Yeah. If you know, uh, it, there is a way to take a screenshot. I always have to look it up. When I I do. Did. But I did. You can take a picture yeah. of it with your phone. But if you go on Wikipedia and put in blue zones, this picture is in Wikipedia. So Wikipedia. I just I just lifted it out of there, uh, and it has some really interesting things. So, I got it. So these um, scientists now have looked at these traits and they've broken it down even further. And so I'm going to show you the breakdown that's even further than this. So the top five, the big five, look like this. It's family, especially uh, social. Uh, relationships, so husband, wife, uh, mother, you know, mother, father, children, you know, relationships, especially communities of faith. The Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist that's very religious. Okinawa, Japan uh, is um, uh, whatever their religion is, you know, Shintoism, or the, I, I forgot what exactly it was. But those two of the three are very, uh, very religious. And actually, it, the island in Italy also, I think, is Catholic. So Faith plays a role in, in all three of those areas. Uh, smoking, there's no smoking in any of those areas. So actually, all five, all five of the areas where they live long, there's very little smoking. Uh, they tend to have lower body weight. And so that seems to be a part of the thing. 
uh, part one of the traits. They, they eat less food. Uh, it's interesting, at Okinawa, there's a, there's a term that they had for it, but and, and in Okinawa, they only eat until they're 80% full. Now, how you exactly do you determine that? I mean, maybe there's a little gauge that people have on their abdomen in Okinawa, or when they get to 80%, they stop. I'm not sure exactly how they determine that, but they don't eat till they're full. They eat till they're almost full somehow. And all those communities, especially the Seventh-day Adventists and the religious people in Okinawa, fasting is a regular part of their faith. And fasting shows up in a lot of these studies as being important for a long life. And, you know, we know God talks about fasting. So in some of the, uh, the religious um, you know, the Jewish feast days, there is fasting involved with some of those feast days. Now, this was very interesting. Um, I've always known that iron is a bad thing. Now, it's not a bad thing for women because when women are young and they have a menstrual cycle with bleeding, iron is very important for women. But women beyond menopause and men in general don't, shouldn't get too much iron. Uh, iron seems to be related to heart disease more than we expect. And so all these people, when they studied them, you know, they drew blood, they did labs, all this stuff. They found out that almost all these communities have low iron stores. And the way they did it is they ate less meat. And I'll show you that on the next slide. They eat less meat. For us, the best way to lower our total body iron count is to give blood regularly. And they find that just giving blood, you know, once or twice a year is all you need to do to lower your total blood, iron blood stores and actually increase your your longevity increase your you know length of days just by giving blood and it's a good thing too so there's all that too so but lower iron body you know stores very interesting that this would that would come out of this all right so here's the rest so those were the big five those were the most important things and then these were the the rest that seemed to be important in all the communities so eating less meat is less iron. So that's where they had less iron in their bodies because they have less iron in their diet. Of course, in all these communities, there's really no empty calories. They don't, you know, they don't have Coca-Cola and, you know, there's not a McDonald's. I mean, there's, these are very isolated communities. They're very rarely going to get empty calories. They obviously are eating more plants and especially nuts. Nuts were very important and showed up time and time again. You know, not peanuts necessarily, but cashews, walnuts, uh, pecans and almonds were very important nuts uh, in a lot of these uh, activity in these areas. Of course, these are all very physical communities. You know, they walk a lot. People, not everybody has cars. Uh, very hilly, mountainous. Some mountainous. Some of these areas. So just walking to the store was a could be a workout. So much more physical activity. They all had very limited alcohol intake, and they had less stress. You know, they don't really you know have you know the electronic and the stressful life that we have, and so they have less stress in general, and they get plenty of sleep. And probably because they don't have electronics, they actually can get more sleep. So <laughs> there seems to be some relationship there, I'm gonna guess. So they were able to get plenty of sleep as well. Well, here's the problem with blue zones. One is the authors have been, sho been shown to be a little bit biased about their study, because one of the things that came up in another study was that Mormons live just as long as some of these other communities, but Mormons weren't included in the blue zones, at least not in the original study, because they were meat eaters. And so people are saying, you know, these authors wanted to show that meat eating was bad, but it's not necessarily bad uh, when it's combined with other positive things. So there was definitely a bias among the authors. Uh, all these communities were very isolated, whether by uh, geography, several of them are very small islands, one's a peninsula, or by their own will to be isolated. The Seventh-day Adventists, are, you know, are very insular and very, uh, you know, keep to themselves, so to speak. And so because they're very isolated, there isn't the things in the modern world that would tempt them like the Golden Arches would. And so, you know, maybe if they put a a McDonald's on, uh, you know, in on Okinawa and some of these remote islands, it may change all the studies, but somehow I don't think that's going to happen. So. so they did have limited technology, you know, less stress, less distraction. They were very, they're very tight-knit communities, so they shun the outside world and the influence of that. 
this was very important. Family generally stays nearby, you know, you know, second, third generations all live in the same area. So there's not the need to travel. They don't get far away from their isolated food sources and their, you know, it promotes their isolated lifestyle. And it, there are things in there we can adapt, but it would be much more disruptive for us at Westerners to accomplish some of these things. Now, dietary change is great. If you really want to get rid of your electronics, that's all good. I mean, there's definitely things you can do, but it would be much more disruptive uh, than, you know, for us to do these things than somebody who lives on a remote part of Sardinia. Um, so those things are really good, but in the real world, we don't always have those options. So if you don't live in isolation on a beautiful island in Italy, and I mean, it does sound like fun. I, it might be fun to visit there, but it might be tough to live. So what is it in our world that really makes a difference? And what can we do in modern America that really could make a difference for us? Well, they have done several of these longevity studies in the United States, given the world that we live in and the technology and the stress that we're under, and have shown there are things that we can do that make a difference. And what we're seeing now is the surprising interpretations of this data. So what I've just shown you with the blue zones is the things that people have always said make a difference. How you eat, uh, how you, you know, what you do, what you don't do. I mean, those things are important, but are they the most important? And so they've been reinterpreting some of these studies and it's been some very interesting outcomes. And now we're gonna look at that. So what are real long life traits? What are the things that really make a difference in living a longer life? And in, in reinterpreting this data, these are the things that have come up. There's six things that have come up that really seem to make a difference when they go back and, and tease out the data with a fine tooth comb. One is love. Love is very important. So, and that shows up as solid relationships and, you know, solid marriages, solid friendships, a very tight knit community. Um, one of the researchers uh, who's very key in the blue zone research he had this, this was one of his quotes, happiness is only the cart, love is the horse. And so you can have, you know, your cart, and, but it may not go anywhere unless you really have love. So if you really want to have happiness that moves you and makes a difference in your life, you need love. Love is the horse. Love is the engine that makes happiness possible. And love trumped all the other attributes combined smoking, all of them, you know, nuts, you know, any veggies, love and relationships, love being exemplified in a, in a lifestyle, trumped all other attributes combined. Very interesting. The second thing they found was being conscientious. Now, one of the hard things about conscientiousness is spelling it. And I, I murdered the word so bad that when Spellcheck looked at it, it didn't have any suggestions. So, so conscientious is not an easy word to spell. So that's the first thing I learned about being conscientious. So what does conscientious mean? Well, it means a strong sense of duty. It means set and keeping goals. To be conscientious is to know where you're going and getting there. And it's to take obligations to others seriously. This was huge in these communities where people lived a long time. They had, they had a very strong sense of their obligations to each other. So that was very important. This is one I didn't expect, being well organized. Now, so already I know I'm on the way out. I probably won't live another week or so if I'm lucky because being organized is not one of my strong suits. So, but being well organized was important because it did, again, represent discipline. It represented people that were more, more likely to make a change and stick with it, which is very important. And so it was people that were more likely to go after what they needed and to get what they needed and most importantly, find it again. How many of you, how many of you, you know, you think, oh my gosh, I need something. You go to the store and buy it. And then when you get home with the thing you bought, you find three of them that you had already, but they were just in the drawer you didn't look in or something like that. So I'm terrible that way. In fact, I'll go to the store and buy something just because I know when I come home, I'll find the one I'm looking for, but that's just me. So being well organized was, was key. 
active in the community. So not only having a sense of community, and that came through love, but being active in the community. That also was very important because it, it, in, the involvement with family and friends was key to uh, being healthy and living longer. And what they showed was being well-connected was a way to get help when you needed it, but being connected was a way to give help when you needed it. And both of those were very important, to get help when you needed it because to get you out of you know, an illness that you had or a you know, problem that you had or stress you found yourself in, but also in giving. We know that giving is very important. You know, giving is more important than receiving, and you know, that's a biblical principle, and it shows up here. And not only active in community, but the part of the community that was the most important was faith community. So having a religious belief and adhering to it and living it were the keys to this point. And so that was very important. The fifth thing was active daily life. So not only active in your community, but staying active within your own life. And one of the words they used was hard driven. People, people who were hard driven uh, tended to have, live longer. So I don't know if that's a good thing or not, you know, but, but being active, I would look at it this way, maybe endlessly persevering. That sounds better to me than hard driven. And so what they showed was though, these are people that are always improving. These are people that had hobbies, you know, that's how we would say in, you know, the worlds that, you know, the world that we live in, but it was new learning. It was always challenging oneself always stretching oneself and uh, not being content with what you have and where you were. That was very important to living a longer life. And of course, this one is sort of a no brainer, uh, shows up in many studies. The joyful heart lives longer. Yes, a merry heart does good like a medicine. These were people who were optimistic. These were people who had a positive outlook, but most importantly, these were people that had hope in the future. These were people whose outlook was beyond today, and it was looking into what's going to happen tomorrow. So, you know, you see the discipline planning for tomorrow, the, the looking forward into, you know, my relationship with tomorrow, and then my relationship with my community about tomorrow. And so, it, you know, having an, a, 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 a hopeful outlook was very important. So... Those were the six most important things that to me were a little bit unexpected because what wasn't on the list of most important things? Well, all these things were not on the list of most important things. When they teased out what really was important, diets weren't really on there, exercise wasn't. Now, granted, these are, you know, a lot of these isolated communities, what they eat is pretty much what they got. They were much more active. So certainly, you know, these things have value. But the most important things boil down to these three things, faith, attitude, and relationships. They made the biggest difference of all. And if I can maybe uh, rephrase that, you, it may sound familiar to you. And why don't we call it faith, hope, and love? Because faith is faith. Attitude really is about hope. You know, the right attitude these people had was hope. And relationships only boils down to love. And so they called it, you know, faith, attitude, and relationships. But I'm a little bulb went off is like, wow, that's faith, hope, and love. And I just wonder if we know someone who wrote a book about faith, hope, and love. I just, I don't know, I seem to recall something about a guy who wrote a book about faith, hope, and love. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, God, that's right. He wrote the Bible. And the Bible pretty much is faith, hope, and love. And I love in Ecclesiastes how it says that God has set eternity in our hearts. And, you know, I, and when you think about that, it's one of those phrases that you'll never get to the bottom of until the other side of the gathering together. Because everything you possibly could think that that phrase means probably means all that and more. And certainly faith, hope, and, faith, faith, hope, and love is somehow in our DNA. It's part of what God put in us to be the people that we can be, to live the life that he shows us we can live, and to do the things he wants us to do. And so, you know, this is all part of his program to live longer. And so faith, hope, and love, and these studies that we're seeing not only reflects the eternity that God has set in our hearts, but how he has called us to be with each other. 
if we're if we're living with each other with trust, if we're living with each other in hope, and if we're living with each other in love, this is what makes a difference in life. And so it reflects also our our gifts and callings in how we're supposed to be with each other in the body of Christ. So let's call these the godly lifelong traits, and let's rephrase them now. Let's go back and look at them in the way that he would you know, how, how these attributes that I just went over, how they would show up in the Bible. And I love it when science, you know, flaps its jaw long enough to get to the place where they agree with what God has said from the beginning, because it's always impressive and always, you know, just awe striking when you can hear science that backs up what God has said. Now, it's not that surprising to us, but I think the world, you know, always is you know, impressed by that. So it's interesting that these new findings don't really show that physical activity is the, you know, be all and the, you know, end all be all like it used to be. And, you know, these were people in a physical society, but it's not the end all be all. And it's interesting because the Bible says the same thing. And this is 1 Timothy 4.8. It says, for bodily training is profitable for a little while but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of the life that is to come. And so physical exercise, granted, it's, it's good, but it's not the end all be all. And God would say and has shown in his Bible that it's better to be spiritually minded than physically minded. And the other thing that we don't see as much on there is diet. And again, the Bible doesn't have a lot about diet. You know, it doesn't point out the kinds of nuts that are better than other nuts. You know, it doesn't weigh proteins versus carbohydrates. And really, when you look at dietary uh, advice from the Bible, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the advice it gives, it's, it's kind of limited. It really is to avoid drunkenness and gluttony. So don't go overboard on anything. Proverbs. And uh, Harry uh, changed the uh, uh, this would mean in our world, and that's addiction. And so this is Proverbs 2020. It's for the addict and the glutton will become impoverished and drowsiness wears rags. In other words, the person that doesn't really, is not really the hard driven, you know, endlessly persevering it's going to end up, you know, in slumber. There's not a lot of advice for diet. Um, but there is a lot about faith, hope, and love. And those studies are showing this is key. And, of course, the Bible is all about these key things. And so there's the whole Bible is all about faith, hope, and love because the Bible really comes down to the use and misuse of faith, hope, and love. If you look at every story, every attribute, every character, every, you know, proverb, every psalm, you know, every, you know, all the things that Jesus taught, I mean, it really comes down to our attitude of heart, our trust in, in them, God and Jesus, and our act, acts of love for each other. I mean, all the Bible comes down to that, and now science is showing that those are the things that we can do to live long. And so let's review the six traits and look at verses from the Bible that back up what the, you know, six things. So first I'm going to summarize each of the traits. So this is trait number one. And I said, love is important. So the relationships are the key. And now I just picked a couple of verses for each one. So in your heart and mind, you may have already have different verses that come to mind. But these are some of the ones that came to my mind about what God is saying about things that we can do to put our heart in the right place to live a better life. And so this is 1 John 4, 7, and this is about the key of love. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, since love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. And then Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, even as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling fragrance. And it's, it's God showing us through his word 
that love in action is what makes a difference in not only our lives, but the lives of others that we come in contact with. So the second one was being conscientious, a strong sense of duty, setting and keeping goals, taking obligations to others seriously. And of course, the body of Christ is all over this. And Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God also forgave you in union with Christ. And another one is Ephesians 5.21 says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. You know, the obligations that we take seriously is being servants to each other and to be there for each other, to speak in tongues for each other, to pray for each other, and just to be, be all we can be for each other. That's being conscientious in the body of Christ. The third one was being well organized. And there wasn't a verse about, you know, keeping a checklist and checking it off when you go to the store. So I didn't really have a verse on that. Uh, but there's plenty on being disciplined. And uh, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So run, so live your life in such a way in godliness that you attain the prize that we know is out there. You know, we have crowns that are promised uh, for when we have our hearts set on certain things that God has made available in our lives. And we can run the race that God has shown us that Jesus Christ has blazed out for us, and we can reap the benefits of what God said is, is available through doing this. And then I love this one, and this is Philippians 3.14. I press toward the goal to win the prize of the high calling of God in connection with Jesus Christ. We have a prize. God has called us to be higher, to be more, to do more, to shine for him, and we can run for that goal. And we can live each day better than the day before. And it's part of the heritage we have now in having the Holy Spirit within and being part of the body of Christ. So we can have discipline. We can be well organized in our hearts and minds to do the things that God has called us to do, to be the masterpieces and, and create the, you know, add to the painting that we're all a part of. So active in a community, obviously this is huge. You know, we, sh you know, we can be involved with our family in such a spiritual way, our friends. Uh, you know, we're connected in community not only to get help, but to give help, and especially the community of faith. And so this is Acts 2.42, and actually this whole section from Acts 2.42 on is all about the faith community living together in a rather dramatic way. But this is the start of that section. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then this one uh, that John just taught on in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tape of the month, uh, I think it was this month, or so maybe it was August. It says, so, that, so this is Galatians uh, 6.10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Uh, and number five was to be active in our lives, to be endlessly persevering. And I love this because we can do so much without ever leaving our mind. Uh, and uh, Karen talked about that tonight, about how God has called us to be mindful in prayer, to be mindful in our quiet times with him. And we can be endlessly persevering and not even get up off the couch. And so we can continue steadfastly in prayer, staying alert in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. And then uh, Romans 12, the end of uh, the first verse and the beginning of the second verse, and of course this whole section, verses 1, 2, and 3, are, are really all about this, about keeping, our, keeping within bounds of what we're called to be, uh, you know, keeping our minds attuned to uh, you know, the, the, the calling that God has called us to, but presenting our bodies. So this is present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be transformed in your mind, to keep your mind renewed is an active process. It's not a one-time deal. It's not a, you know, once a month or, you know, once a day. 
it's a continuous process. So it's, you know, we have to be endlessly persevering for the calling that we have in our lives. And of course, the sixth key to living a better, longer life is to be joyful, to have hope in the future. And James 1 verse 2 says, my brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. And then Hebrews 12, 2, uh, the first part says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the leader and finisher of our trust, who because of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And certainly that's the vision that we have. That's the example that we have. That's the life that we can live, that no matter what comes up in life, we're looking at the joy that's coming in our hope of the future and not at the circumstances all around us. So these are the things that have shown up now in these studies about living a life that's, that's better and longer that does jive with what God has said all along, that faith, hope, and love are most important, and that love is still the top attribute. So just like these studies have shown, love comes out on top of all the attributes that help people to live better and live longer. Love is the top attribute. And just like you know, God said, you know, you know, now abides faith, hope, and love. This is 1 Corinthians 13, but the greatest of these is love. So how does that show up for us? Well, John uh, chapter 15, and if I paraphrase, says, if we love him, we will obey him. And if we obey him, we will live in his love, and our joy will be full. And that is the way to live a life that's full and more than abundant. And so the key, if you boiled it down to the key, you know, what is the absolute bottom line to, living in a God, to live a godly life? It comes down to two things. One is we need to love our Heavenly Father with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, and to love our neighbor, our close one, as ourselves. And that is the whole key. That is, that, that tops exercise, that tops diet, that tops, you know, nuts, that tops Oprah, that tops Dr. Oz, <laughs> that tops the Atkins diet. And it's, and it's something that we can do every single day. We can choose to live godly, to walk in a godly way. And every time we do, our life gets better. It gets more full and it gets to be the kind of life that's worth having. And so... I, I kind of, so now we're going to read a couple of verses from the revised Tyson version, the, the RTV. Uh, so the revised Tyson, Tyson version is take a couple of verses from the Bible and put them into a physical exercise framework. And so I'm sure you'll appreciate this. So we can put on the mind of Christ. So you're doing reps every day. You know, you can do putting on the mind of Christ. Those are great reps. I suggest, you know, at least one an hour, that's 20, well, you got to sleep sometimes. So it wouldn't be 24 reps in a day. But, but we can actively take your arms and put on the mind of Christ every single day. Philippians 2.5, that's in the revised Tyson, Tyson version. You can put off the old man and put on the new man. So you, you, know, you can do those curls. Those are uncurls and recurls. You know, you can, you can feel the blood flow to your brain getting better just even thinking about this. So you can walk worthy of the calling uh, in Christ Jesus. You know, we can put on Ephesians 4.1 and just walk our little hearts all over the place. You know, my ventricles, I mean, they're feeling better just sitting here thinking about it. <laughs> we can run the race that's set before us. And again, you don't even have to get off your couch and already you're getting healthier. It's a wonderful thing. You can press toward the goal, press toward the, the goal to win that prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So when you're thinking of doing your curls and your presses and your walking and your running, um, you know, I, I tried to get one for Pilates, but there's not a verse about, you know, keep the Pilates of the Lord always before you. So, uh, or there's not one on abdomens or biceps either, but so I had to, you know, probably in the revised Tyson version, I probably could work some of the words to get that in, but so far, I've not figured that out. But so there's things that we can do to make our lives better and, and just enjoy the fitness of the spirit that we can have that impacts not only, you know, it comes from the spirit, 
but it affects our mind, it affects our bodies in ways that we can't even understand. Just like we talked about fellowship. You know, when Jesus Christ is in the midst, we're feeling better just being together. And that's, you know, there's something about that that's healthy. You know, the merry heart doeth good like a medicine, and it's because our attitude is right. We're thinking about the hope, we're thinking about each other, we're putting Christ on in our minds, we're doing those curls all the time, and it's making us better, it's making us healthier, it's making us have a life that's worth living. Now, so, I wanted to do that, and I wanted to show you, I promised I would do this, uh, let's see if I can get out of this. Uh, I'm going to show you this, because it's really cool. Um, this, so you can put, so if you Google, um, all right, so first I need to give a disclaimer. Uh, I have Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance, but I am not an agent or in any way endorsing <laughs> Northwest Mutual Life. Um, Jeff Tyler is a Northwest Mutual Life um, representative, but he did not put me up to this, so he's not part of this either. But if you go online and put in longevity calculator, you'll get a lot of choices. This is the only choice that I found where you don't have to put in your email address to get a bunch of advertisements from them to get the results of what you put in. This is the only one that's free and there's no strings attached. So, so if you Google this, uh, so it's, it's called Northwest Mutual, well, just put in longevity calculator and look for, it says like NMW, um, you know, LC. It's just initials. And you click on it, and I'm just going to show it to you. So I am going to show you uh, because you can play with this. The cool thing about this is, and I'll show you how, how it works, but the cool thing is you can go back and start over. Now, in order to start over, you have to, you have to X off of it completely and reload the whole page because once you put in data, the, the beginning data that I'm going to put in right here, it won't undo unless you X the whole page right off and start over. But what you can do is say, all right, when I was 10 years old, so you put in, you know, your age is 10, you're male or female, and then it's going to ask you all these health questions. You can project what it'll say, how long you're going to live, and then see how old you are now and see if you made it. You know, that's kind of interesting. I will tell you a word of advice and warning is don't put in 99. Because if you put in 99, there's this little thing here that says estimated age and years. If you put in 99, that number keeps going up automatically. And I, I quit it like a thousand because I knew I was going to, I guess it's a saying, if you live to be 99, you could live to be a thousand. I, it's possible. You know, <laughs> you got that far. Why not go to a thousand? But for some reason, when you put in 99, it goes crazy. And the numbers just keep adding up no matter what you're doing. And so don't put in 99. You can put in 90, but that's as high as you can go. So I'm going to just show you now because what you can do is play with this. So I'm going to put in right now. Can you guys see this okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm 62. I'm a male. And uh, I'm now I used to be six foot two, but I'm going to be honest and put in six foot one. I used to be 180, but right now I'm 230. So, you know, it's, it's close. <laughs> um, and it starts to show how old you're going to be based just on that. Now, the key thing is it's going to ask you health questions, uh, attitude questions, relationship questions. And you can see every time you answer a question, it's going to add or subtract a couple of years. And so you're going to see a couple of things. One is you can see where you are right now, if you're honest. You can see about how long you're going to live. The second thing is if you go back and play with it and say, all right, now what if I lost weight and I really weighed blah, blah, blah you know, how much would I, how much longer, how many years could I add? And it could be just one or two years. You know, if I quit smoking, and I'll tell you right now, smoking is the biggest change. And even quitting smoking now, whatever your age is, adds years to your life. And it's, it's the most impressive out of all the choices you have. But you can go back and play with it and say, well, what if my blood pressure was more under, under control or, you know, what this, what that. And you can see what really makes a difference, whether it's just a year, all right, so for instance, if you eat more kale, if you eat more kale, you're going to add about a year to your life. So if you're like me and you think kale is just like a bitter tasting spinach with hair, then adding one year to my life is not going to be worth it. I am not going to add kale to my life to get one lousy year out of it. 
Now, I might add ice cream and see where that goes, but I'm not going to add kale to my diet. So you can play with it, though, and say, well, what if I did add kale? What would it get? So, so now, so this one now says family members. So um, I have, I've had a really good family in that we rarely have any heart disease. So I just added two years to my life by my genes. Now, remember I said genes, it was about 10 to 25% of how long you live. They're, they're my genes added two years to my life, a very small amount. So you can go through this. Uh, my blood pressure is, uh, I check it and it's okay. Uh, and you can say, you know, whatever one applies to you, you got high, medica or high blood pressure with medication. Um, let's see, uh, stress to me is a positive influence. I have a very stressful job, which I love. And so stress to me is not really a big deal. Um, do I exercise? I do a lot of walking at work. So I'm somewhere between, I'm probably, I walk at least 30 minutes a day. So I'm, I'm walking a lot at work, so that's good. Um, do I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables? Not really. Uh, do I eat an average amount of fruits and vegetables? Not really. Uh, so I'm going to pick the bottom one there. And it didn't, it didn't change very much. So this is what I show you about the diet thing. The diet change may not change that much. And so my diet is not as good as it could be, and I could do better with that. Do you always buckle up in your car? Absolutely. And if you get in my car, you buckle up, and we're not going anywhere. Um, I've had no accidents or violations in three years, so this is your driving history. And if you're a poor driver, you'll see how many years you take off. You might want to go to a driving school and slow down because it will make a difference. So I'm a pretty good driver. I added a year for pretty good driving. Uh, I do not drink more than two drinks a day. At least I can't remember drinking two drinks a day, which might be a sign I drink more than two drinks a day. No, I don't drink more than two drinks a day. Uh, so that added a year or two. I've never smoked, so that's going to add a year or two. Um, and I never use drugs for recreation. Uh, that adds a year. And I do regular checkups, and that adds a year. So once you get out here a ways, it doesn't add that much to your life. Uh, and so I'm going to live to be 90. So I'm going to be able to terrorize my kids, my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. And I am just so <laughs> thankful for that opportunity. So are they. <laughs> so are they. And so, but now you can go back. Like I say, you can back up on this calculator and you can see what made a difference. You can play with it about changes you want to make in your life. Hope, faith, hope, and love, they're the biggies. Those are the ones you need to work on the most. And then these are smaller things you can do that you can see really don't have that big an impact. You want to eat kale? Fine, eat kale. You know, you don't want to buckle up your car seat? Don't buckle up your car seat. But uh, there are certain things that make bigger difference than other. But it's something fun to play with. All right, so having said that, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to go back to not sharing the screen. So is my screen gone? All right, good. So I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to stop there and see who's awake <laughs> and how we did. So the beauty of this is that science finally caught up to the fact that, that the Bible, you're, you're muted, Sandy. I didn't hear you. Oh, there you go. I got 95. Right? Wow. Ooh, you All know, right. girl. Everybody over to Sandy's house, find out what she's doing right. <laughs> That's um, too funny. So, so you could live on Sardinia and still be right up there with them. And you didn't yeah. live on an island. You didn't eat any nuts. Well, I mean, you probably do eat nuts. But, I mean, you, you, know, you weren't climbing up mountains. And so there are things we can do, you know, to live longer. But to live awesomely, you need faith, hope, and love. And this is how science is finally showing that, you know, they don't call it faith, hope, and love. But that's what's really important. Yay. Wow. Oh God. <laughs> and unbeknownst to him, he does eat kale. He just, it's, you don't even know. Sometimes. They grind it up. <laughs> so you can't, the, so you can't push the hair. You can't feel the hair. And so I, I do eat kale. I just don't know. It. It's, in, it's in your breakfast story. You just don't know. <laughs> you know, you could get to 95 and go, why didn't I eat more ice cream? If I knew I was going to get this far, wouldn't I have eaten more ice cream? I mean, come on. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Karen, so, Bailey, I think when, so when you were talking, I remembered the, the study that I read a long time ago about the rabbit study and that they were doing a study to show whether 
a bad diet caused atherosclerosis. And so they were doing this study on the rabbits uh, to show that, that, that it caused bad heart disease and stuff. Well, and it turns out, you know, that they, the rabbits that were on the bad diet did get bad heart of you know, the arteries, except there was this one group of rabbits which didn't seem to get that. And they couldn't figure out, they studied and figured out, try to figure out why the rabbits in this one part of the you know, study didn't get the hardening of the arteries. But they finally figured out that the rabbits that didn't get the hardening of the arteries were on the lower cages. And the attendant that came in at night to take care of the rabbits was short and she couldn't reach the high cages. And so she could reach the low cages and she gave those rabbits lots of attention and rut and petting and things like that. Wow. Ah, there you go. that's a love. There you go. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. That is, that is. Mm. Bunny love. I've heard of puppy love. Bunny love. Bunny love. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. One of the suggestions you had in godly long life traits reminded me of um situations where you're with people you cannot stand <clears throat> being around them because they're because they are just irritate you and you just can't so i finally figured out how to deal with that i realized that jesus died for them too and that has really helped me <laughs> believe me or not <laughs> It, it, I realized that, that, you know, even though they're abrasive and they're <clears throat> irritating to me, Jesus yeah. died for them, and that really helps me. <laughs> I speak in tongues whenever I'm around people like that, nonstop, the whole time I'm with them practically, so that I don't get stressed out or anxious or snap back at them because it's so contagious to be around a person who is negative and bitter. It's so contagious. You got to guard yourself with that. So that's my two cents. Well, you know, that, that's healthy on every level. That's healthy spiritually. That's healthy mentally, and that's healthy physically. And that's that's the that's running the race without leaving your mind. You're running the race to to get to that prize mm -hmm. just by speaking in tongues for them. Because we know speaking in tongues interacts in the universe and in our environment in ways we don't understand. And you're praying for them and, and what, for what they need, even though we don't know what it is, God knows what they need. And by energizing that speaking in tongues, you bring Jesus into the equation. And he's there to minister, to, you know, inspire, to reveal, to, you know, whatever it takes. I mean, it, it, it helps us to receive spiritual things for them, maybe, but it helps in their lives as well in ways they don't understand or sense. Amen. Amen for that. Isn't is in Hebrews somewhere someplace that stay away from bitter person? Doesn't scripture advise stay away from bitter person? It's contagious. Yeah, the seed the, the root of bitterness, I think it talks about the root of bitterness. Samuel. So stay away from them, but speak in tongues for them, maybe. And maybe that's <laughs> I wanted to say, uh, Gary, that I, I really like your sense of humor. And uh, I got a question. Do you think up the real jokes ahead of time, or do you uh, just do them on the fly? Uh, some of them I, I think of ahead of time and then don't remember them when, I'm, when I should be using them. So most of them just come to mind in the moment. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's part of having a really warped mind, I think. <laughs> so. uh. Well, I've heard that, uh, uh, that one trait of comedians is that they can recognize uh, what's a little bit off because they know what's on. <laughs> well, at work, I have, I have a lot of one-liners, and they call them Tysonisms even. So I'm famous for my one-liners, things like, you know, when things aren't, aren't going well and people seem to be making, you know, poor decisions, I always say, well, we'll burn, the, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. So, just all kinds of crazy things that come to my mind as I'm working. So, 